the opportunities that would truly make us wealthy are not going to come around every week. They'll come around every so often and they come around at unpredictable times. But when they do come around and when, when you do recognize it, uh, you need to act very significantly and very quickly. So uh, I haven't given uh, this talk before, so uh, to some extent you're guinea pigs, so thank you for being the guinea pigs. It's somewhat different from a lot of other talks I've given, and I've al always felt that the best way to learn is to teach. And so, quite frankly, uh, one of the big reasons I wanted to put this together was to actually educate myself. And actually, I got quite an education in putting the talk together. And I think I'll get a little bit more of an education in the interaction today. So that'll be great. So the focus of the talk is really to, you know, it's, it would appeal to, I would say, a few different audiences. So one is, if you were considering a career as an investment manager or, or an investment analyst, I think the talk would be helpful in helping you figure out whether that is the path you ought to go down. And even if you are a person who, who has some assets and uh, some savings and trying to figure out kind of how to, how to invest those, I think the, the talk will add some value on that front as well. So most of the material I'm going to present is plagiarized because I have no original ideas. You, you'll, soon, you'll, see, you'll soon learn that. So I'm actually going to be channeling a guy named Peter Kaufman and another guy named Charlie Munger and a little bit of Warren Buffett thrown in. Peter is the uh, author of Poor Charlie's Almanac. Some of you might be familiar with that. And uh, it's a wonderful book. I think it's one of my favorite books. He's, he's very close friends with Charlie Munger. And I think one time he told Charlie Munger that, you know, Charlie, you and Warren have been successful for three reasons. And uh, do you know what those three reasons are? And uh, Charlie told him, no, Peter, why don't you enlighten me? So Peter said, well, the three reasons you guys have been so successful is that first, you're willing to be extremely patient. Uh, you guys are not in a hurry to do anything. You're, you're willing to be very patient. The second is that you're willing to be very decisive. So when opportunity presents itself, you don't hesitate to, to act. And Munger has referred to this kind of like man with a spear standing there waiting for a salmon to go by. And so he's got the spear ready, and, and he's perfectly happy waiting there for hours and then you know a, a big juicy salmon goes by and he spears it and so you know extreme patience coupled with extreme decisiveness and the third trait is having no concerns about being different from the crowd so you know doing whatever they feel makes sense regardless of how the world looks at it so they don't really care about you know the what people might say if they do something. So and what Peter what Peter said is that you really have to kind of unpack that a little bit. So uh, when when he says being patient, it's not about being in agony while being patient. It's being in bliss while being in patient while, while being patient. So it should be a very natural trait for you to be very happy to watch paint dry. So if you're the kind of person who loves to watch paint dry, then the investing business is a very good one for you. Uh, the decisiveness, again, you know, it shouldn't make you break out in sweats. But when you see every so often, you know, Charlie says that for each of us, the opportunities that would truly make us wealthy are not going to come around every week. They'll come around every so often, and they come around at unpredictable times. But when they do come around, and when you do recognize it, uh, you need to act very significantly and very quickly. And that, again, is a second thing that a lot of people have issues with, where they'll recognize something, and then they'll make a 2% bet. So that also is a second trait. And then the, the third one about being different, this is probably the hardest one for humans. You know, humans are averse to stepping away from the crowd. And uh, so having no concerns about how people think about you based on what actions you take is a very important trait, and having no stress about it. So, so each of you can kind of evaluate that for yourself in terms of whether those are, you know, does the glove fit, if you will? Does the glove fit with those traits? Uh, to some extent, uh, I, I think they must be, at least most of it needs to be inborn. It, I think it would be a little bit difficult to take a high-speed trader and convert him into a model like that. Uh, so you need to have kind of a, a natural bias towards that in your, uh, in your personality. And then, you know, the, the other piece is, you know, how do you uh, make investments? You know, how do you know something's a great idea or not? And I think, I thought what I'd do is, 
I'd uh, take the example of, of one investment that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger made, uh, which was the investment in Coca-Cola. And I, I wanted to go through the, the mo models they used when they made this investment. So there was no spreadsheet ever created when they did the Coke investment from then till today. It's been about almost 30 years since they made the investment. Uh, they have no analysts or associates or anyone who helps them. I don't even believe they made much in terms of notes when they made the investment, but they thought very deeply about it. And for most investments, if you can't do the math in your head, then it should be an automatic pass. Uh, so there was no DCF model run for Coke. There was no, no uh, numbers-based uh, models. I mean, they, they had some numbers in their mind, uh, but they never, I don't think they ever reduced them to paper. But they did have, uh, I think, and I may be missing some of them, but I think there were dozens upon dozens of models that they used in making uh, the investment. And what happens is that when, when you have an overlay between models, uh, that's when you get uh, what Charlie Munger calls lula Palooza effects. You know, one plus one becomes 11. And so it's really kind of the interplay between the models that lead to kind of the aha moment and such. So, Charlie Munger had given a speech to a group that basically elected to be secret. They told him not to disclose the name of the group that he gave that speech to. And after he gave the speech, where part of the speech covered the Coke investment, they told him it was a useless speech. That, you know, and so they didn't appreciate it. And, uh, and I, I actually think it's one of his uh, more brilliant speeches and actually it gives you a, a window into how they think. So I think it's useful. So anyway. Uh, the Coke investment that Burke may, Berkshire Hathaway made was made between 1988 and 1990, about a three-year period when they bought the stock. And uh, at the time, they invested about $1.3 billion into Coke. And $1.3 billion at that time was approximately one-fourth of the book value of Berkshire Hathaway. So they made a very significant bet. I mean, you think of an insurance company taking one-fourth of their equity into a single stock, and that's what they did at the time. And uh, the last bit of Coke that, that Warren bought in 1990 was bought at uh, about 25 times trailing earnings. So it wasn't cheap by traditional metrics that you, that you might, might use. But on, on many fronts, they considered a no-brainer, and obviously they've now uh, not touched that position for um, almost like, you know, approaching 30 years. And I don't think they're gonna touch that position even well after Warren and Charlie are gone uh, from the scene. So I, I, I don't think the Coke position is going to get touched at Berkshire for a very long time. So why did they make the investment, right? And what, what went through their minds to make the investment? And uh, so one of the things that uh, Warren and Charlie have said is that if they had not invested in C's candy, they would have never, ever invested in Coke. So to understand the Coke investment, we should go back to the Seas Candy investment because that'll give us some clues. So in 1972, they bought Seas Candy. How many of you are customers of Seas? Have you ever had Seas Candy? How many of you have never had Seas Candy? We have a few unfortunate humans. <laughs> Maybe you can, uh, next time you're going through some airport, you know, get some peanut butter brittle. That might be a good start. But anyway, so they bought C's in 72. And uh, in 72, they bought C's for 25 million. And the deal almost didn't happen because the family that was selling wanted 30 million for the company. And Warren was already choking at 25 million. He thought the $25 million price was really rich. And the reason why Warren thought 25 million was rich was C's was a company that was, at the time was generating about two million a year in cash flow. They had eight million in net book value, and the purchase price was 25 million. So they were playing more than three times book value for the business. And when the family said they wanted 30 million, Warren just said that, hey, at 25 million and one cent, I'm out of here. Uh, you know, so you can either take the 25 million or you know, we'll, we'll walk. And they are very grateful that the family didn't walk and uh, sold them the business for 25 million. 12 years later, in 1984, C's was earning 13 million. So in 72, when they bought it, it was making 2 million. 
In 84, 12 years later, it was making 13 million. The book value had gone from 8 million to 20 million. And uh, the unit volume over that 12 year period had only gone up by about 2% a year on average. So if you look at the C's candy purchase from 1972 and take it all the way till today, the unit volume growth of C's has been about approximately 2%. The you know, number of pounds of candy they sell every year has gone up about 2% a year over the last, let's say, 45 years or 44 years or so. But their earnings have gone up significantly more than that. It's a private company. They don't disclose the numbers. I would, I would guess that C's is probably approaching 100 million, maybe somewhere in the 70 to 100 million, maybe even more than that in terms of earnings per year at this point. And California GDP from 72 till now has grown up as probably five or 6% a year. So C's did not keep up with California GDP growth over that period from a volume growth perspective. And in fact, even the 2% volume growth that has come in has come in with square footage increase. So their retail space went up by approximately that number, which led to that, that growth. And Warren and Charlie say that uh, the river of cash that came out of seas funded a zillion, zillion other things at Berkshire. So they would, they would, if you ask them today, you know, what is the value of seas to Berkshire? They, they probably couldn't even tell you, but it would be in the tens of billions. It would be very significant in terms of what it did. And if you were to ask them today that, you know, so, Charlie says that we were barely smart enough in 1972 to buy C's, barely smart enough, because he says that, you know, if the family didn't budge to our stupid demand of 25 million, we would have walked. And actually, if you go backwards and think about it, they could have paid 100 million for that business, and it would have been a low price based on what happened after that, right? So it was a phenomenal business. And the only thing Warren did, the only input he provided to management, they kept the same management, Chuck Huggins kept running the company. And the only thing he did was he said that on January 1st of every year, I will send you the new price list. So he took over pricing for the company. So you know, all their pre peanut butter brittle and all their fudge pricing and everything else. Uh, beginning of the year, Warren would look at, you know, okay, you know, inflation is 3%, let's bump all the prices by 12%. And, and year after year, they, what he found is that they could raise prices significantly above the rate of inflation, and it didn't have any negative impact on sales. Sales just kept going. And uh, what they also found out a few other things. They got a huge education in brands and branding, and that education in brands and branding was very fundamental to the Coke purchase. So. Seas is a California phenomena. You know, people in California, if I, if I had the same talk going on at Columbia University or something and I asked the same question, they'd look at me like I was from Mars. They probably never heard of Seas except for the few that have gone to Omaha. So they repeatedly tried, and uh, Warren and Charlie occasionally would try to uh, nudge management to expand Seas into other geographies. And every time they tried to expand other geographies, they would fall flat on their face. So they'd open a store, I think one time they had a store in Chicago, never worked, they've opened stores in several geographies, it's never worked. And, but slow expansion in California has worked. And so, so they found that the brand had certain brand value in California. They, they also found that people were willing to pay a premium for C's candies in California, but that same cachet didn't follow through in, in other locations. So, when the Coke uh, uh, idea came in front of them, there were a couple of things that were different, from, different about Coke from C's. The first thing was that Coke traveled really well, and they could see that. Repeatedly tried to take this brand into even the neighboring states, they couldn't do that. There are only two countries today in the world where you cannot get Coke. And uh, I forget, there's North Korea is one of them, I forget what's the second. Pardon? Yeah, Cuba, that's right. So Cuba and North Korea are the only two countries uh, where you cannot get Coke today, right? But, but what they noticed is that in, even in these two countries, if Coke tomorrow started selling in these countries with no advertising, it would take off. 
in quite a significant way because it's, you know, that, that brand uh, has meaning even to people who have never drunk Coke before and never seen an ad because it's so, so much part of pop culture and movies and whatnot that it's, it's entrenched. So basically what they, what they found is that unlike, unlike C's, Coke traveled really well. And, and Warren, uh, Warren studied this phenomena of the difficulty of traveling with C's very carefully because he was very interested in making C's global. He would have loved for C's to become a global company. And with all the brain power they had, they could never do that. And, but here was a company that was naturally a global company. The second thing he noticed that was different between C's and Coke, so you know, he's been drinking five Cokes a day since he was six years old. And so you know, Coke's been a regular part of his diet for like 80 years or something. So the second thing he noticed was that there was a limit to the amount of fudge you could eat. You know, so as you eat more fudge or C's candy, your ability to eat more of it uh, declines. And, but with Coke, you know, the lack of an aftertaste uh, means that the ability to consume Coke was quite significantly higher than the ability to consume candy. In fact, the, a person can consume five or six Cokes a day pretty much for their whole lives without really feeling like they were having something monotonous. And many of us do that. How many, how many of you have uh, one or more Coke products daily? No one admits to having Cokes. <laughs> so um, actually you're having other Coke products, you just don't recognize that they're made by the company. Uh, they've got like over 100 brands. So the second thing they recognized was that unlike fudge and peanut butter brittle and such, that uh, peanut brittle, I'm sorry, that, uh, that you couldn't uh, Coke, you had no aftertaste. And so the volume you could consume and the frequency with which you consume it was quite different. And in fact, even uh, if you compare it to something like McDonald's, which is a very good model, but if you were eating at McDonald's every day, uh, that will, could probably get to you uh, much faster than consuming Cokes every day. So they noticed that uh, this particular product has this nuance of recurring consumption not really being an issue uh, in terms of purchase. So th these were some of the models that they knew about before they, before they started to research uh, Coke. And the third thing they also recognized, difference between C's and Coke, what with, was with C's, you needed retail space, right? So they had to have a C's store and you know, pay rent and all these things to sell it. But Coke sold in all these places where the company didn't pay any rent. You know, it was just sold all over the place. So it had, it had uh, and I'll go through a little more details about the kind of the, the capital light model of Coke. So there were a number of reasons why Coke was very capital efficient, far more capital efficient than even C's was. So even though C's in 84 was producing 13 million on 20 million invested capital, I mean, that's a very high return, you know, 65% return on invested capital, really good business. Coke was even better than that. It, it was a truly remarkable business. So then the second part of the mental models that come in is that Warren and Charlie like to go through long histories of these companies that they study. So with Coke, both of them read every annual report since the company was public. So they, start, they, they read every annual report from 1919, which is when Coke went public, until the late 80s, every single annual report. And they got some insights from reading those annual reports. And one of the insights they got was that from the period of 1919 to let's say 87, there had never been a year when Coke's unit or, or uh, cases sold was lower than the previous year. So through the Great Depression, through the Second World War, through the Korean War, through all the stagflation of the 70s, through all of that, unit case volume just every single year went up over the previous year, nonstop. And the second thing that they noticed was that Coke, which started in, uh, in Rome, Georgia, went through this uh, major international expansion. So they were repeatedly, over the years, uh, they were first only in the southern US, then they kind of spread out through the US, and then Canada, and then they started spreading out. And in fact, World War II took them to all the places where the uh, US Army went. And so they, f they saw the whole way Coke entered one new country after another, and what happened after they entered the country. So they, they, they could see that from the reading of those reports. And what they concluded was that the runway was really long. And I'll, I'll get to the runway. So 
the way they defined the runway uh, from reading Coke is that humans need to ingest water to survive, right? So we need to ingest about 64 ounces of water a day to survive. And uh, humans prefer to consume flavored water over plain water. So at least some portion of that 64 ounces, uh, they prefer to consume flavored versus plain. In fact, Warren's daughter says that she's never ever seen her dad drink water. You know, she, she, she says she's never seen her dad drink a bottle of water or drink a glass of water, never happened. Um, and so Warren, I think what uh, 40 ounces a day is coming from Coke. I don't know where the other 24 ounces are coming from, but she says water is not part of the deal. So if you take the 64 ounces that humans have to drink, they figured that at infinity, you'd probably get to something like 50% of that volume gets consumed in one way or another in a flavored format. And you can take that today where if you look at something like Dasani, which is a Coke brand for water as part of that. So, you know, some kind of bottled kind of uh, beverage becomes about half of it. And they, they felt that Coke could probably take 50% of the, uh, of that, uh, of the flavored portion. So 16 ounces, uh, per day per person, which is two servings. So they just looked at the unit volume, they looked at the number of servings, they looked at the number of humans, and they looked at that runway, and they said that we've got a long ways to go here. And so you've got basically this distribution engine where you can pump a lot of brands through it, you know, Minute Maid and, you know, Monster and all these, all these things. And uh, world population was growing. So as world population grew, co-consumption would grow, GDP was growing, in countries where GDP is very low. So, you know, if you look at a country like Mexico, for example, the per capita Coke consumption in Mexico is the highest in the world. It's, it's above the US. And there are other countries in the world where they're at one hundredth of Mexico's uh, volume. So Coke would grow as it went into new countries. It would grow as GDP grew. It would grow as per capita consumption grew. And um, so that was another part of what they learned from reading those annual reports. And then uh, Warren read this, um, Fortune article, which was written in 1938 about Coke, and the writer of the Fortune article said that, you know, this is a marvelous, marvelous company in 1938, has done so well. And, and then he said, well, of course, the ride's over because the company went public in 1919 at $40 a share, and now that is worth 3300 per share. If you, you know, go back to the stock splits and all that, so they said, you know, the, so the writer of that article said, you know, it's great to know that, but you know, the ride's over. And Warren says the ride was not over because if in 1938 you invested a fresh $40 into Coke, by 1993 it was 25,000. So you had, you could have missed the first 20 years and you still had runway after that. And so they, another, another model they used was they didn't have an anchoring bias. A lot of times in investing what happens, and in fact I'm very guilty of that, is we tend to look at kind of past performance of, of, a, of a security and that taints the way we look at it. And actually what you really ought to do is ignore the past, just focus on the future. And so they were really good at not having this bias about, hey, this company has been growing from 1884 till 100 plus years, now we want to invest in it. And 100 years after this company got formed, we're putting one fourth of our capital in have we lost it? They didn't think about it that way. And then, you know, the, some of the other things they, they realized is that the, the company was currency proof. It was uh, asteroid proof. It was thermonuclear blast proof. It was uh, anarchy proof. It was pretty much bulletproof from any way you look at it. So if you think about a situation where uh, you have, let's say, a LE, extension level event, take place, right? So let's say an asteroid comes in, and let's say the asteroid takes out six and a half out of, out of the seven billion humans. Let's say we're left with a few hundred million. Well, the Coca-Cola company has the trademark, and uh, they have the formula, and they will eventually start producing Coke again, and they will probably get back into business. And, and such, and you could not say that about almost any other business when you have that sort of an event take place. And so even if uh, currencies changed or got devalued or whatever happened, Warren's perspective was that people would be willing to trade two minutes of labor for a Coke. 
And so the, the trading of labor versus coke would be independent of, of currency. So there was another um, part, of the, part of the model. And then, you know, the, the notion that our mouths are a very personal space, right? There's a few spaces humans have kind of very, you know, are very sensitive about. Mouth is one of them. And uh, we're kind of uh, sensitive about what we put into our mouths. And so um, if you see a Coke and you've had it in the past, et cetera, you won't think twice. And even if you're in a different country, you'll have it, no problem. But if you see some kind of unknown brand, it's kind of like, you know, you, you eat Wrigley's chewing gum and then uh, someone presents to you Glott's chewing gum and, you know, says, would you like some? You know, you're probably not going to take it. And uh, so, so the, our mouth is a very personal space and we're not going to be messing around with trying to take the low bid on what goes into our mouth. So they, they felt that we are creatures of habit. Once we get these habits formed, then we're not going to be willing to change them, especially with personal spaces like our mouth. And the second is about humans are creatures of habit. You know, like we, we'll, we'll shave every day on the same side of the face first, or in the case of ladies, the same leg first. We do things in a certain pattern. And, uh, and again, once we get to those habits and patterns, we are reluctant to make those changes. So they, they saw all these things, and they saw all of this was kind of coming together from the reading of the annual reports. And then they looked at the, you know, so I have already probably gone through maybe 20 or 30 different models they used. We, have, we still have a lot more to go. You know, there's, a, there's a, a lot of more models they went through. But in all the models that I've gone through with you, we haven't talked about any numbers. You see, so I, I went through all this stuff about it being a great investment. We haven't talked about numbers, really. And so now I'll just go through some numbers. But none of these numbers need a spreadsheet. They're kind of um, uh, very, uh, very simplistic numbers. So the way the Coke model works is the Coca-Cola company produces concentrate and syrup. So let's go back to the point where there's just one product, which is Coca-Cola. We won't go through the 100 brands they have right now, but let's say there's only one product, Coca-Cola. They produce concentrate and syrup. The syrup gets sold to bottlers around the world, and, and the bottlers then produce the Coke cans and bottles that you see in supermarkets and everywhere else. And the, the Coke company uh, also sells the, the syrup to various fountain operators, so like Burger King and McDonald's and so on, where you can buy fountain drinks. Uh, so there are two models, right? So there's the bottling model and then there's the fountain model. And, um, or let's say a restaurant and such. So the way the bottling uh, model works is the Coca-Cola company does not set the price of a bottle of Coke. It lets the bottler do that. So they can pretty much set whatever price they want. What it does do is it sets the price for the syrup. And what it does do, just like Warren did on January 1st with C's Candy, is on January 1st, they bump the price of the syrup nonstop and been doing it for 100 years. And, um, and so the, the simple economics is that if you have a can of Coke on sale at Costco or wherever, you might get it for about 25 cents, you know, 12 ounce can. The 25 cents, the Coca-Cola company gets around uh, six cents, six or seven cents of that comes to the Coca-Cola company for the syrup. And the rest of the, let's say, 18 cents or so is shared between the retail outlet that sells it and the bottling operation that produces it. And um, so the bottlers is where a large amount of the CapEx is happening. Right, because they've got all these bottling plants, they've got all these trucks, they've got drivers, they've got all the distribution going on. The Coca-Cola company just needs a few plants around the world to produce syrup. So, and the number of people they need to do that, so when, when Warren and Charlie were going, going to make the investment, the Coca-Cola company had 17,000 employees. All the bottlers had half a million. So the capex is on the bottlers. And so, so this is uh, C's candy on steroids because you don't have any retail. You know, it's kind of like it reminded me uh, one time I was visiting Microsoft. I think this was like probably 15 years ago. 
And uh, you know, they, they used to sell their operating system to, for example, Dell. So Dell would install Windows on all the, all the machines. So I, I, I was talking to one of the Microsoft em, uh, engineers. I said, so do you guys like uh, sell, send the, uh, the CDs to Dell and then they, you know, when you buy the computer, you get the CDs and, and, and such. Uh, they said no, uh, or the floppy disk, they said no. He said, we, we give them one copy and then everything else is their cost. Okay, so Microsoft wasn't even willing to spend the money on the disk. Uh, even that they dumped on the PC makers, right? So that was the, it was even better than the syrup business. At least Coke has to provide syrup. In the case of Microsoft, they just provided the bits once, and then they charged you on the bits, which is why it's such a beautiful model, and Mr. Gates is the wealthiest person on the planet. And, um, and so it's very really funny, like, like he said, he, he looked at me like I was dumb as a doorknob. He said, what do you mean I'm going to send them CDs? No, I'm not going to send them CDs. I'm going to give them one, one, one copy. And then he told me that once it got to streaming, we didn't even send them a copy. We just streamed it to them. You know, <laughs> not going to send them a single copy, right? And uh, so in the case of Coke, it's not quite uh, uh, Microsoft. They still had to sell the syrup. But what they did is they came up with one more enhancement where they got to concentrate. So the syrup had sugar in it. So what they did is, and it had water, and what's the point of uh, you know, shipping these heavy things? So they actually improved the model to just giving concentrate and telling the bottler, add so much sugar and add so much water, and now you've got the concentrate, uh, you've got the syrup. So they even took it down one level further. So, so you take the 25 cent can, the Coca-Cola company gets about seven cents. Uh, the cost on that is, basically next to nothing, it's sugared water. They're not even paying for the sugar. And the bulk of their, you know, they spend about 10% of that on advertising, and approximately about 25 or 30% of that number is pre-tax profits. You know, so that's, that's basically their, uh, their model. That's on the bottling side. Now, when you get to the fountain side, things get even more exciting. So when you go to a restaurant and you ask for a Coke, you know, they don't charge you 25 cents. What do they charge you, Alex? Couple of bucks, yeah. So, so you know that that eight or twelve ounce serving is now twelve bucks. The Coca-Cola company is giving it to the restaurant at probably I don't know fifteen cents or something, and they are very benevolent and they let the restaurants make a lot of money on the cokes. And so, what happens in that format is the restaurant loves Coke. You know, is the highest volume, highest margin product of anything they're going to sell, right? And and people want it, and people ask for it by brand name, etc. Uh, like you know, the ones that don't offer Coke and, you, and they have Pepsi, they have to they have to ask you, you know, would you uh, like a Pepsi instead? And you know, you kind of say, oh, okay, you know, it's fine. I'll take the Pepsi. Take a bullet for the team. So, uh, so the fountain sales model. If you think of the ecosystem, everyone makes money. You know, the restaurant makes a lot of money. The restaurant's very happy. The bottler that converts the concentrate to the syrup makes money. They're very happy because they deliver it. Uh, they do the last mile stuff. And the Coca-Cola company is obviously very happy. So both these models uh, work really well. And you know, just to give you kind of a, a sense of the capex differential, uh, you know, before they made the investment, these numbers have gone up quite a bit since then. But they're sc in scale, they're correct. So the, all the bottlers were spending in the mid '80s about 1.3 billion in capex every year, and the Coca-Cola company is spending 160 million. You know, approximately like 12% of what the bottlers were spending. So most of the most of the volume, or most of the benefit uh, of all of this went to the Coca-Cola company. And then you know, you look at you know, Warren has obsessed over the fact that there was uh, you know, Branson had started Virgin Cola, and then there was Sam's Choice, and there were all these kind of private label type colas, and they studied that. And bottom line is that none of those ever got any traction. So why didn't they get traction? Well, number one, you know, the personal space, the mouth, you know, you're not quite sure about Sam's choice, even though you like Sam Walton. And, um, and the second is the economics, they can't really undercut. So if you think about the 25 cent can, well, the reason it's at 25 cents is because of global scale. You know, this is a global company selling at a huge volume. I mean, they're buying aluminum at a huge volume, all those things, right? So you try being even Walmart, with whatever volumes Walmart has, and then you try to get customers to not buy Coke and buy Sam's Choice, how much can you undercut Coke by? The, they, they've got about two cents that they're making on that 25 cents as profit. 
and the bottler is probably making another couple of cents. So you got about four cents. So once you go to, if you had the exact same cost as a Coca-Cola company, if, if you were at 21 cents and Coke was charging 25 cents, you would make no money, right? And if you didn't discount versus Coke, who would buy Sam's Choice? How many of you consume Sam's Choice? Does it even exist anymore? Does it exist anymore? I haven't I've been to Walmart lately. Does Sam's Choice exist? Alex, you haven't kept up. No. All right, so, but in Costco, I don't remember. Maybe you guys know, because I don't pay that. Does Costco have a generic cola? Do they sell? No. I don't think so, right? Do they have? Oh, so that's the, that's the, st that's, is that the store brand? Yeah, so, so, so they, they've got some private label, but they've got the big containers. Okay, who, who, who drinks Refresh? Is it cheaper? And is it, do they have a cola? I think they're <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, so you see that, so what, what they found is that if a competitor tried to come in, and the store tried to do a private label or whatever else, they really couldn't undercut them because the economics just wouldn't allow it. So this is what, what they understood about Coke, some of the things they understood about Coke when they read those annual reports. Now, now we get to another set of mental models, which is the mental models on branding. So, so the Coca-Cola company, uh, basically, you know, now the market cap of Coke is about 190 billion, and I'm guessing they're you know, probably 17 times or something. I think they're probably making like, I don't know, 12 billion or 13 billion or something in, in, in after-tax profits. And the Coca-Cola company has always spent less than 10% of their revenue on branding. Uh, and one of the things about the branding is, so when you, when you see a can of Coke, the can of Coke is actually branding, right? Because it's all got the Coke brand and everything. Who's paid for that? It's the bottler. Is that part of the 10% that the Coca-Cola company spends? No. That, that Coke can is completely paid for by the bottler. Those red trucks you see, paid by the bottler, right? That's also not part of Coke branding. Those are all things that are, so every single case and can and stuff about the, about the, the fountain uh, displays and all that is all kind of continuous branding going on without them spending a dime. Others are spending the money on that. And when Warren invested in the Coca-Cola company, they were spending less than a billion a year on branding at the, at the time. And, and he said that if you gave me 100 billion and told me take away the market leadership of Coke, I would just return the 100 billion to you. It couldn't be done. So the, the, even though they had spent, so it had been 100 years, it had grown, they were spending less than a billion you know, a decade or two before that. The, the unusual thing about branding is that when things get etched in our brains, like Coca-Cola is etched in our brains, it has this uh, kind of um, multi-year effect. So what Coca-Cola spends in 2016 on branding is not exhausted in 2016. It has residual effects even 50 years from now. So, so when you have a, a business that's been at it for 100 years or more, uh, that brand just keeps getting more and more popular. And you know, one of the things, uh, another of the mental models is that uh, red and yellow are primary colors for humans. You know, we get attracted to red and yellow more than anything else. And uh, that's, so that when I look at logos, and they use the color red and yellow, like, like McDonald's is, makes great use of red and yellow. yellow. Wells Fargo uh, does great use. So especially logos with have those primary colors, I think they have more of an impact uh, long term than the, than the non-primary colors. And um, so, so basically, one of the things about, about, about Coke is that uh, this brand has got itself so deeply etched into our psyche after all these decades and uh, more than a century that the, the cumulative effect of everything they've done in the last 100 years exceeds what they've spent in the last 100 years. 
in terms of brand value. It, it significantly exceeds that. So Warren felt that for 100 billion, you couldn't take away the leadership of Coke. And at the time they were investing in Coke, uh, the market cap was less than 20 billion. So they were, they were basically, actually it was I think probably less than, yeah, I think they, um, maybe 15 billion or something was the market cap. So they had a huge, uh, huge amount that they could, they could get. And the other thing about, about Coke is that um, uh, we'll finally turn on PowerPoint. Sorry to talk so long. Okay, so the other thing about Coke is that th these are some scenes from different restaurants in, in India, in the middle of nowhere actually. They're not in any cities or anything. So if you see that top restaurant there, it's called Prakash Dhaba. Uh, that's in the middle of nowhere in India. And you see all that Coke signage everywhere. Uh, so here's how that happens. So the bottler, uh, the Coke bottler, goes and meets the restaurant owner and says, listen, do you want a paint job? And, uh, and you know, we are, and do you need furniture? And, the, and all for free. He says, oh yeah, of course, you know. Furniture's great. So the furniture's gonna be red. You see all the red furniture. Uh, the, one, the one table is probably what they had before. Uh, they got left and then, you know, the second is he says, like, you know, do you want like us to put your business name on the top? Like, he says, yeah, sure. So what they do is you see on the left that Prakash Dhaba name is a little bit there and the rest is all Coke, right? And here's the funny thing. The restaurant owner loves that. And why does he love that? He loves that because people trust him, you know? He's got a trusted brand, and so now they think, oh, you know, this place, it can't be so bad. You know, we can get our Cokes, and we can get all the other food and all that. So it's, the, it's the, what, what Munger would call the association tendency. So what happens here is the, the Coca-Cola company gives some uh, matching funds to the bottler. And they tell the bottler, listen, go paint the town red. Okay, literally paint the town red. And we'll give you a little bit kind of a change. And so you see that uh, the second picture on the left is the inside, uh, not the same restaurant, different restaurant. I think that guy is only an outdoor place. Uh, so here, same thing. We'll give you a paint job. And you know, all the, all the furniture's red and everything's red. And, and uh, the guy's probably very happy about it and, uh, and such. So, um, so basically, the, the thing is that these, these types of signs and these types of insignia you would see deep in rural China. You know, very deep in rural China. You'd see very deep in rural India. Middle of nowhere you'd see this. I mean, the, the penetration is way beyond the cities and all of that. It has gone deep into uh, the hinterlands. And so that, uh, that distribution all the way down uh, at that level is extremely powerful. And, and so uh, when, you, when you look at this brand, uh, even though the company spends less than 10%, the actual you know, uh, amount of impact it has is just massive. You know, it's just uh, huge. Uh, one time I interviewed a guy, and he worked for, for Coke in, in Atlanta, and he lived with them all over the world. He was originally from Morocco. And he was part of the team that managed uh, uh, the World Cup relationship for Coke with FIFA. That was his whole job, you know, football, you know. And uh, not him, him and, uh, you know, probably 30 other guys at Coke. And so I'll get into this a little bit later, but the association tendency of being at places where humans are happy, you know, so the FIFA relationship with Coke and all the, the global sponsorships, the, the Olympics, you know, so these are Disney, you know, so all of these places, McDonald's, where people are generally happy, Coke wants to be there, right? And so they've got this, the, the etching of this brand over uh, the decades in all these places all over the world is huge, right? And, um, and then we get to the managers. So Coke, Coke had uh, such an incredible model in, you know, this is a, this is a uh, company that just produces fountains of cash. You know, it just gushes cash. You just can't lose money. You just, you know, just send the syrup and you're getting massive. And so what the company did over the years is, generally speaking, what happens is that when you have businesses with great business models, uh, you end up with dumb managers 
who do dumb things because even when they do dumb things, they look really good because the business is so good. And so Coke would put their money into buying shrimp farms in Thailand and all these unrelated businesses. And almost everything they bought was a far worse business than the core business that they had. And in 1981, two guys came on the scene. Uh, Roberto Goizueta became the CEO, Cuban guy. And, uh, and then uh, Don Keo uh, became his, uh, under him, the president. And so these two guys, and Goizueta was, uh, you know, there were some unusual people in the history of Coke uh, going back the decades, but Goizueta was a very unusual guy. So he was really good at marketing and branding, understood this model really well. And he was really good at finance, understood capital allocation really well. Uh, very unusual to have uh, a numbers guy with a branding guy uh, put together. And Keo was just a great operator. So what they did in, when they came on the scene in 81 is they started dumping all the other businesses. Uh, they got rid of all the, everything Coke owned, which was not related to beverages, they got rid of. And the only thing they bought was uh, they bought Paramount Pictures uh, in 81. And then they realized about five, six years later that even that was dumped. And in 87 or 88, they dumped Paramount Pictures. So what Warren saw was from 1981 till his first purchase in 88, in seven years, that these two guys, uh, finally this was a company that had real capital allocators. And so what they were doing is aggressively buying back the stock. So what the Coca-Cola company started doing was they had this gush of cash coming in, the dividend was going on. It's the only, one of the only companies that for 50 years, uh, I think more than 50 years now, has raised the dividend every single year. I think, uh, I think there's no other company in the NYSE that's done that. There's some that have maintained it, but they've raised dividends every single year. So the first thing they did was they, they cut out, got rid of all the crappy businesses, sold them. And the second is they started aggressively buying back stock. Um, and uh, so they basically they took their cash flows. And, um, and Goizera was brilliant. So uh, Warren, I think, saw the, what was going on with Roberto Gozueta and, and Don Keo, coupled with all the other stuff I just told you. So now you finally had a business which had management that got it. And, and that's why um, they, they went in. And, and Roberto Gozueta himself owned 2.5% of Coke. Uh, so, so he actually had a significant economic interest. And... Um, and went from there. And now, you know, the thing is, many of you are skeptical because of the whole sugar issue, right? Like if I ask you to drink Coke, most people say no, because I don't drink sugar, right? So they actually addressed that this year at the annual meeting. So Warren, Warren says that, you know, he's, he's uh, 86 years old, in great health, been consuming five Cokes a day, cherry Cokes, uh, since he was six years old. And and you know, so he dismisses all these health issues people bring up with sugar and whatnot. And he says that uh, you know, he wishes he had an identical twin brother who spent his whole life eating broccoli. And, uh, and he said, if, if I had my, this identical twin who would just drink bro broccoli and you know, plain water, then we'd have a, a test. We, we would see him at 86, and we'd see me at 86, and we'd see who was healthier, OK? <laughs> and, and basically. His, his perspective was that, and I think he, he talked about it as a joke, but then Munger actually elaborated. He said it is very dumb to discuss negatives about a product without discussing the positives, right? So one of the things uh, we have to realize as humans is that, yes, excess sugar has problems, you know, causes health issues and whatnot, but Having, having a Coke at certain times will add a lift to your step, right? And so, so the, that lift to your step, uh, it's very difficult to quantify. And I think this is the reason why Warren says he wishes he had a twin brother, because the thing is the guy lives such a happy life on all fronts that uh, I think science doesn't fully understand the impact of low stress and happiness on health. Right, so there's there's a there's an impact there which we we don't fully realize, but uh, you know I'm pretty sure it's there. So uh, yes, if you go wild and crazy and you know have 
huge amounts of sugar consumption, and then that leads to health issues. There's a problem, but uh, you know you can be Usain Bolt drinking two cokes a day and be just fine. You know, so so there is a so they don't they don't see they don't see the sugar issue being a significant issue for Coke. And the second issue with Coke is they now have more than 100 brands. A large number of their brands, uh, including Coke, have no sugar. And a large number of them even have no carbonation. So, so it's, you know, when you get to these places, they're not pumping Coke over there. They're pumping Coke, they're pump pumping Dasani, they're pumping Minute Maid, they're pumping all kinds of products through that distribution engine, right? So it's not just sugar being pumped through, it's a sugar. And the other thing about the company is just to tell you how, you know, the Coke has made a lot of blunders over the years. Uh, so one of the blunders they made is that they never wanted the Coca-Cola product to have anything but the true Coke product in it. So when there was a concern about sugar and people were talking about diet drinks, they did not want to create Diet Coke. And they did not want to call it Diet Coke. And they didn't want to take that beautiful bottle and the red color and mess with it. They didn't want to do that. So they, what they did is they, they called that product Tab. OK, how many of you heard of Tab? Some of you, yeah, see the older guys. Older guys have heard of, heard of Tab. And for the longest time, Tab was this you know, stepchild. And then Tab became Diet Coke. You know, eventually, they realized that we can put the Coke bottle with the diet without the sugar and might still work, and it worked. So, um, so they got to it, and then uh, you know we, we're getting to the uh, to finally the part about what I call the glots section. So, uh, how many of you read uh, the glots uh, paper? That uh, I think some of the uh, some of the folks have read it, right? Uh, so that was a speech which, which Munger gave when they told him it was useless. Um, so Munger kind of inverts logic. He, so he says, you know, how do you create a two trillion dollar company with a two million dollar investment, right? How do you create that? And and the way he does it is he says, look, uh, let's go in 150 years. He says in 150 years, how do you take two million to two trillion? And so he says 150 years, 2034, uh, which is 150 years from when Coke was formed. He says that uh, if there are seven billion humans and they're consuming the 64 ounces, and then uh, half of it is flavored, and then uh, one half of the flavored comes to Coke, and we are getting about two cents a serving. Let's say by then, with inflation, we're getting about four cents a serving. You run on the numbers that Coca-Cola Coca at that point is making about 117 billion a year in profit, which would give you a market cap of two trillion. And so he says that's how we get to uh, that's how we get to two trillion. And uh, he says that uh, so what are the things we do? to create that two trillion. He says, first of all, this guy Glotz, who's setting up the Coca-Cola company, doesn't want to call it Glotz uh, flavored sugared water. He wants to call it Coca-Cola, because he likes that name better. And so he, he creates a name, and he uh, does a lot of stuff to promote the name. And the second is, he says in 1884, consumption of sugar and caffeine is well accepted in society. You know, We have coffee, tea, lemonade. So we lose sugar and caffeine because people like that. And using sugar and caffeine, we're going to create uh, this product. And not just the sugar and caffeine, what we'll do is we'll give it a color like the color of wine to make it look kind of high end. And we'll give it carbonation to make it like champagne. OK, so we'll put the sugar and caffeine and the, the color of wine and carbonate it. And now we've got a great product. And then we sell it really cheap so that you know, everyone can buy it. And, um, and, uh, and then he said, you know, we have a choice. Do we create a, a beverage that's hot, you know, like coffee or tea, or a beverage that's cold? And he said, well, cold beverages can be consumed in a much higher volume than hot, hot beverages. And when you're kind of you know, near the equator and really hot, you can have an almost unlimited ability to consume cold beverages. So he says, it's a no-brainer. You go with cold. So he says, you go, you go with cold. And then, then he says, now we go into the mental models of the way human brains are screwed up. And so he says, the first is the association tendency, which is that, you know, put it in places where people are happy. Because when people are happy and they see Coke, then they associate uh, happiness with Coke. And, and then we finally get to our next slide, which is my favorite slide, 
which is, uh, which is the, the Maryland slide, right? So the association tendency is if Maryland's drinking it, then definitely I want to be drinking it too, right? And, uh, and so the association tendency, what Coke did in all its ads for the longest time and even now, is they associated with celebrities, right? So in India, they'll, they'll pick some of the top Bollywood actresses and the same thing here. They'll, they'll put these people in because the association tendency, uh, humans uh, kind of do very well with that. And, um, and then, you know, the, the social proof tendency of humans is another mental model, which is, you know, monkey see, monkey too, which is that, you know, when we see other people drinking Coke, we want to drink Coke too. And so show people having a good time with Coke uh, and, and all of that. And, um, and then he says, you know, do it both ways. Uh, do it with uh, fountains and do it with bottles. Uh, and then he says another thing we would do with the Glotz beverage company is that we would, we would basically create this aura around secrecy. So, you know, people think there's something unusual about Coke because the formula is secret. It's in a vault in a bank. And quite frankly, the, the secrecy means nothing. Because he says that eventually, with food science going where the way it was going, everyone would figure out how to make something close to Coca-Cola. But by the time they figure it out, we would have had brand and other things uh, come in, which would, which would help us uh, kind of keep the competition at bay. And the, he says the food chemistry that helps our competitors make a product like ours also helps us by reducing the unit costs. You know, like, like they went in the US from sugar to fructose, which was a lot cheaper, and they just made their whole, all their efficiencies in, in how, they, how they got there. And then, you know, then he goes to Jacobi inversion, which is, you know, what not to do. You know, what are the things that you don't do to get to the two trillion? So he says the first thing that you don't do is avoid losing half the brand name. So, you know, the Coca-Cola brand name uh, has two parts, the Coca and the Cola, right? And he says, don't lose either part of it. If anyone came up with anything called Cola, sue them and take them out. And so he said that in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, he would have made sure there was no other Cola. They could call it whatever else, you know, Glotz, bottled water or whatever, or carbonate water, but no cola, right? So that's the first thing. He says you wouldn't lose half your brand name. You would avoid envy by basically having a standard great product at a great price, which they did. And then the final thing he said that, you know, don't change the flavor, even if someone comes up with something better. Keep the flavor, because it's not about the flavor, it's about the brand. And that brings us to the cola wars, which very few of you are familiar with. How many, how many of you are familiar with the Pepsi Challenge? Yeah, the usual cast of characters, except you. How do you know about the Pepsi Challenge? I read a lot of Wikipedia. Okay, all right, yeah. good. Uh, so some of us lived through the Pe Pepsi Challenge. Did you take the Pepsi Challenge? Yeah. All right, there you go. So basically, Pepsi had a problem. In the, in the mid-'80s, they had a problem. They knew that people preferred Coke by a huge margin to Pepsi, by a, like a two-to-one margin. And they, they knew that their brand was inferior. Uh, you know, if, if Burger King offered Pepsi and not Coke, then people would not think of Burger King as, use, as well. So every way they had to discount stuff and all these things it was really hard for them. So John Scully, before he went to Apple, you know, he became he, he's the one who went to Apple and then ousted Steve Jobs. So before he went to Apple, John Scully was the chief marketing, marketing officer of Pepsi. So he was brilliant. He said, how do I take out Coke. He said, the way I take out Coke is I take away the brand name. And the way I take away the brand name is I ask consumers to do a blind taste test. And in a blind taste test where you, so, you know, if you put in front of someone a Coke and a Pepsi, they'd go for the Coke because of all that conditioning for the decades. But now if you take away the brand and you just give those, you know, those tasting cups um, and then have them taste it, well, Pepsi is sweeter. It actually tastes better, right? So in the blind taste test, people will say, oh, I prefer this one. Then they'd show you that it was Pepsi, right? And so they started taking market share, and Coke got rattled. So Goizuera and Keo, who were part of Coke at that time, they got freaked out. 
they said, you know, basically these guys have figured out that our product is inferior. And so what they did is they came out with New Coke. And New Coke was sweeter and it was better than Pepsi. And there was a major uproar, right? So all the diehard Coke guys were horrified that how can you change the formula? I mean, it's all about the formula. I want Coke, I want New Coke, right? So there was this huge fiasco that now they had, they had messed with the family crown jewels. Right? They took away the, the one thing that was there, which was that secret formula and all the things about the secret formula. In reality, Coke had changed the formula many times, but they never told the public that they changed the formula. Right? They just did it quietly. This was very visible. They called it New Coke, and there was a huge backlash. And then they realized, the Coca-Cola company realized that they screwed up. So then they introduced classic Coke. Okay? So then there was New Coke and classic Coke. You remember that? We had both, right? That was even more confusing, okay? And then they finally realized we've got to kill this whole thing, go back to just Coke. And that's what they did. They went back to only Coke and they survived that. So, uh, so what, what Munger says is that, look, this essay I wrote about taking two million to two trillion, he says in reality the company started in 1884. And by 1896, 12 years after they started, they had no earnings and they had 150,000 in total assets. So the much less than 2 million they started with. He says they lost half their, bra their brand name, right? So they were not able to protect the cola part of the brand name. They lost that. And they also screwed up with uh, the, envy, uh, the envy of Pepsi, and they went to New Coke and all of that, right? So they did all these mistakes, and, uh, and they also had... Uh, what they did, I think, in 1900, they didn't think bottling was going to be that big. They thought bottling is kind of a sideshow. So they signed these agreements with these bottlers, which fixed the price of syrup permanently into the future. So like in 1900, they said, we will give you syrup at whatever cents per pound for the next 100 years. Fixed price. Okay? Completely destroys the model, because then sugar went sky high, and they started losing money. So then they are telling the bottlers, we can't give it to you. They said, no, you have a contract. And so then they had to battle the bottlers, and finally they got some, uh, some leeway from that. So they made the, that mistake. And then what they had done is the, the bottling rights, what they had done originally when they gave bottling rights, it was a day's horse ride. So the way they set it up was that they looked at how far a horse could go in a day and a back, and that's how they defined the territory of a bottler. Okay, and that didn't make sense once you got to automobiles. And, and the, so, so first, they had very big territories because Coke started expanding. So they wanted to reduce those territories. The bottlers didn't want to give that up. And the second is that they had some many useless bottlers, right? So these, these bottlers, I mean, this is the license to print money. You got, you got a monopoly in an area. Uh, you got the Coke product, it's going to sell. And so you don't need to be that great a businessman. And so they had to really kind of go through Don Keard a lot of work where they brought back a lot of bottlers and did all kinds of things to, to get their, their model back. But in spite of all that, uh, Coke from 1884 till now, with all the dividends they've given out, they're now at a, uh, Munger, Munger, when he gave the speech, the market cap was 125 million in, 18, in 1996. So he said if Coke's market value grows by about 7.5% a year, you'll get to two trillion from 96 to 2034. And if you go to today, of course, 96, I think it was an inflated uh, multiple. If you go to today, Coke is at 190 billion. To get to two trillion by 2034, you would need to be at about 14 and a half percent a year. I'm not sure they'll do that, but the other thing that could happen by that time is since we get these cycles in stock markets, you might have a 30 multiple on the company. You know, Coke was sitting at a, 40 multiple in 1999. So you, there's a chance you might get some crazy multiple at that time, and that might get you to, uh, uh, to the two trillion. So, um, so basically what I wanted to just say is that um, you, you can see the work that Warren and Charlie did. Uh, so usually the thing is, one is they, they get a little bit of information edge because they're willing to dig deep. You know, they're willing to read a lot and whatnot, uh, which most people aren't willing to do. The second is where they get a lot of advantage is the synthesis. 
you know, when they read, what are they kind of extracting out of that model? And the third is that they understand that when you have multiple, multiple model, models interplaying with each other, I mean, when you put a great manager like Goizueta on top of a great business, uh, you just get phenomenal returns. I mean, those are, those are just exceptional uh, in terms of what ends up happening. Uh, is great business with a great manager. And then we get to some of these other nuances about personal space and all these other things about brand and, and such. Uh, you, get to, uh, you get to kind of these lula loser effects. So in the, in the investment business, I think that um, this is the holy grail. You know, this is kind of when you get to this level of analysis on, on a business, uh, you got it. You know, and then, then, uh, then, then you got it there. And, and so the key is to make very few bets, uh, make very infrequent bets. And, uh, and when, when seven moons line up, you, uh, uh, you bet big. <laughs>